what up guys, Command here, and welcome to a new video where I'm going to do my review on Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Now before we start, I thought I would give a little quick recap on Fallen Order and what I thought about that game, because I don't quite remember ever doing a review on Jedi Fallen Order in its entirety, and I can't seem to find it on my channel, so I don't think I did. However, if you want to skip straight to my Jedi Survivor review, I put chapters to this video across the timeline, so you can skip to that section if you like. So Fallen Order, when it was about to come out, was a very highly anticipated game for me. I love the Force Unleashed games, and the first one is what I would say would be my favourite Star Wars game of all time. Amazing story, brilliant combat mechanics with a development system which makes you feel like you're actually training and learning new skills to combat your enemies as you progress through the story. So Fallen Order had a lot to live up to, and while I really enjoyed it, it didn't come close to what the first Force Unleashed game did for me. The story was good and all, and I liked the idea of following this quest of this old Jedi to find a holocron with force sensitive children on it, which could lead to a big impact on the galaxy if used by Cal and Sia, but could be detrimental if it falls into the Empire's hands. However, at the end, Cal just destroys the holocron, and while I understand the reason why, without the knowledge of Eno Cordova from BD1, the Empire would have no way of finding the holocron, so to me, that whole quest with the game was just completely pointless. When it comes to combat, Fallen Order is very fluid, and it's sort of satisfying to mow down stormtroopers in a variety of different ways, and there's a wide variety of enemy types to fight as well. One thing that I did, it did bug me a little bit was how many scout troopers were around, and while I understand that they were the melee enemy and it is a sword fighting game in a sense, it always confused me that when there were times throughout the story where, we, where you would find more scout troopers around than stormtroopers, Whereas in the Force Unleashed, for example, you spend a lot of your time just mowing down countless stormtroopers in environments with a squad of stormtroopers or like a flame trooper or something showing up every now and again, which makes it more realistic. Like I said, I can see from a gameplay perspective why this was done in the way that it was, but from a canon point of view, it kind of throws me off a little bit. Cal's Force Abilities are also a highlight of this game. Much like what I liked with the Force Unleashed, you feel like you're learning new skills as you're learning about how the story is developing, which makes you feel like the you are the character of Cal and that Cal is a reflection of you. However, Fallen Order does this better by having Cal remember some of his Force powers being taught to him by his master, Jarrah Dapal, when he meditates, which I think is a really neat way of doing it. It also allows for a little tutorial so you can see exactly how this ability works, but not by being thrown into this random arena to learn it, but rather through a forced vision, which is a lot more believable as far as the story is concerned. So for the most part, I love Fallen Order, but the story and hostile encounters fell a little short for me in a couple places, which is why I put it below the Force Unleashed. Now on to Jedi Survivor, but before I do, I just want to put a spoiler warning, I'm going to go into deep story and gameplay spoilers from now on, so do be warned. Now, let me start by saying this, Survivor may be my new favourite Star Wars game of all time. Nearly everything that was a problem in Fallen Order has been improved, and everything that was good about Fallen Order has only gotten better. Now, that doesn't mean this game is perfect, but I will get onto that later. While I'm on the topic of things not being perfect, let me get straight to the elephant in the room, performance. So, as you're probably aware, especially if you're, you play on PC like me, this game launched in a very bad state performance-wise. For a brand new AAA title, not being able to be run on a 4090 smoothly is wholly unacceptable. I have an RTX 2070, and at medium settings at 4K, I should be getting about 50 to 60 FPS, but I was sticking at 30 to 40, which isn't right. Even cutscenes, which should be getting about 50 to 60 FPS, I was running just like 30 FPS or below, and also game the cutscenes in this game are all in engine, by the way, which I will get to that later as well. While I found it playable to play at about 30, 40 FPS, there were time it's still quite jittery, and there's a number of occasions, especially in the first level, where I was dropping to 12 FPS. I know I don't have a powerhouse PC, I don't claim that by any stretch of the imagination. But I have an RTX 2070, an AMD Ryzen 3700X and 16 gigs of RAM, as well as the game itself is pre-installed on my NVMe SSD. So according to the specs on the Steam store, I have what's recommended to play this game at a solid frame rate. Four days after this game's release, they did push out a patch which seems to have, a f have fixed a few problems. However, I'm still having slight issues with low FPS, 
but I don't know if that's a limitation of my GPU or whether that is actually the game itself. Now, I am in the process of upgrading to an RTX 4070, mainly for trade to renders and Unreal Engine and such, but if I am editing this video by the time I install the new GPU, I will add a section after this to do a little bit of extra testing to see if the better GPU makes a difference or not. So I'm just interjecting with a separate bit of audio now that I've installed and done some testing on my RTX 4070. While it's not perfect, I'm playing the game at 4K medium settings at around 50 to 60 FPS. Now, I personally think I should be getting 60 FPS solid or more now that I've got 12 gigs of VRAM and not 8. So overall, I do think the extra horsepower does help, but also this game is not optimized to the extent that it could be to give the performance given the hardware at hand. So now onto the story. This is what makes the game shine. I've never been so invested in a video game story since Arbiter's story in Halo 2. Pretty much everything about this game's story hits the nail on the head in more than one way. The introduction of a villain, Dagon, from the High Republic was something I never saw coming, and I genuinely enjoyed, enjoyed his character and learning throughout the game about his history and why he did what he did and why he's trying to get to Tanalor. Throughout the game, even though it is quite long, it never felt like a chore to get through, because there was enough lore about Dagon and Tanalor, as well as other things as well, to keep me invested. And the motivation for Cal to get to Tanalor in the first place is so strong you can almost feel the cruciality of the mission and the stakes that are at hand. Much like the Ark control tower in Halo 3. You know what will happen if you fail and you feel like the sense of urgency to get there quickly before the rings activate and kill all life in the galaxy. However, once we defeat Dagon is when I feel like the game starts to dip a little bit. There are about three or four different times after we defeat Dagon that I thought we were going to end the game, but we just carried on. Obviously the first one is after we defeat Dagon himself, the second is after the Imperials attack on the base, when Bo gets away and Seer dies, the third is when we attack the ISB foundry and Bo gets away again, and then the actual end of the game, after we kill Bode and then cremate him, Seer and, Can and Cordova. Now, while I did enjoy those levels after Dagon's death, I just felt like it was just dragging me along a little, because I kept thinking, well, we're we being left on a cliffhanger for the next game, and but no, we just finished what we started. It's not bad per se, it just, it just got a little bit tiring in the end. One thing that did help it was that Bo's motivation for doing what he did was very understandable, and I genuinely didn't know if Cal was going to let Bo live for the sake of his daughter, Kata, or kill him and leave Kata with both of her parents dead. It's one of those impossible situations that you find yourself in, and it did make the end section of this game more bearable to play, and not feel like it, I was being dragged along unnecessarily. Now on to the, the Mantis crew. Now, at the start of the game, the crew of the Mantis are scattered across the galaxy doing their own thing. Now, to start with, I thought we'd have to go on this wild goose chase to gather them all together. So each level, so Grease, Sia, and Merin, all on different planets, and then it would all take up one massive level. It actually happened quite quickly. Grease was on the second planet we visited and joined us quite quickly afterwards, and Merin and Sia were both on Jeddah, which sped up the gathering of the crew again. It was also nice seeing Nino Cordova after him being your guide in the first game, but I honestly thought he would play a bigger part in the story. A bit like Sia though. She seemed so hyper obsessed over what she was doing that she couldn't see the bigger picture and the benefit of finding Tanalor. It almost felt like they sidelined her character a little bit. Sia quite clearly has become a stronger and more powerful Jedi, but also it almost came across to me like she had become a little bit more arrogant as a consequence. Like when she faced off against Vader, she had the opportunity to follow BD, get on the Mantis to safety and get away from Darth Vader. But she chose to stand against him and thinking she could beat him, but she obviously didn't. But she knew who Darth Vader was. We know that because in Fallen Order, Seer literally says, it isn't good news, it's him. She knows who Darth Vader is. Why, knowing how powerful he is, why would she think she'd stand a chance against him? Again, I think it comes down to that arrogance trait she's developed. Grease is always the paranoid comedy relief of the game, and much like the first one, he's very much the same here, but I think they could have given him a little bit more development in his character. We see from the start that he has a prosthetic arm, but nothing's really explained about it. 
Cal mentioned it to say briefly, but that's about it. Like, okay, I'll just accept Greece just lost an arm and just say nothing. Mary was by far my favourite part of this game. One reason, obviously, was the romance she had with Cal, which was hinted at during Fallen Order, but was expanded on more in this game, which I was quite surprised they went as far as they did with it. I was expecting that after the first kiss, they were just going to leave the storyline to either at the end of the game or leave it to the next game entirely. But by it being expanded in this game, it makes me worry about what's going to happen in the next game with Merrin and Cal. Another reason I liked Merrin was because of how far she has come from being this broken knight sister mourning over the loss of her sisters and her planet to the, after the CIS attacked. But she has spent time looking for herself throughout the galaxy and traveling to various different planets, but knowing that when Cal needed her help, she was there for him. She seemed to be Cal's voice of reason in this game. There were a couple of times that Cal tapped into his anger and his dark side, but Mary was there to say, no, stop. Think about what you're doing. We have lost so much to the Empire. Don't let us lose anything else. Not only is that good for Cal to have that voice by his side, but it's also good development for Merrin, who we saw in the first game just blindly attacking Cal because he was a Jedi and acting on impulse and arrogance, whereas where she is now by Cal's side to support him and fight beside him. It's almost as if Seer and Merrin have swapped roles in between games, I think. Now on to combat. This is another element where this game shines brightly, and it's probably the only part where I have no complaints. Far too nitpicks, but I will get to that. The combat in this game for the most part is the same as Fallen Order. However, in Survivor, it's so much more swift and fluid, you actually feel like you're swinging that lightsaber around. And you can see quite clearly how Cal's abilities have improved, and the use of, more, of a more expanded skill tree means that progression is even more detailed than the first game, which is awesome. The different stances make the gameplay so much fresher as well. My two favourite were the dual blade lightsaber, so the two different lightsaber hilts, and the blaster stances. I did play with the crossguard one a little bit, but unless you're in a boss fight, it's a little too clunky for large amounts of hostiles, which I, which I think is the point of that stance anyway. I also like how the seamless transitions between switching stances. It's a small touch, but it's polished like that which I really do appreciate. The dodging system though in combat, oh my god, it was bad in Fallen Order and it's just as bad in Survivor. When you hit dodge, there seems to be a little delay before you actually do the action. Especially if you've just finished a parry chain with an enemy and then they go for one of those unblockable moves. I struggle to dodge it and I think many other people feel the same way. I've seen others compare Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor to God of War. Now, I want to premise, I've never played God of War, so I don't quite know how the gameplay works in comparison. But if what people are saying are true, and I have seen gameplay of God of War, but I've never played it myself. But if what people are saying are true, and what I've seen seems to be the case, it's very much the case of you hit your dash button and you dash instantly. And if Jello Survivor or Fallen Order, or even the next game that they're developing, could add that feature it would be really quite, it'd be a good feature to add. I understand it's trying to increase the skill level, but it's just annoying to me. And a lot of the time, especially if you're playing on harder difficulties, it just makes the game such a ball lake to get through some of the bosses sometimes. The companion system is also a very welcome addition to combat as well, especially Merrin because of how OP she is when she's using her magic. Bode was okay, but mainly because he had blasters so he could distract the enemy whilst Cal attacked from behind. Whereas Merrin, I actually felt like I was fighting by her side, rather than with her if that makes sense. I was fighting beside her rather than with her. If that makes sense? Maybe not, I don't know. I do wish that after the campaign we could ask Merrin to tag along with us and help us fight in the world in general, or even find more companions that could help us. I kind of wanted Ravis to join us after we beat him and to add another ca companion to our roster, but that never happened, which I thought was quite strange. Another small nitpick I have with the combat is similar to what I said about Fallen Order, in that the enemy encounters, for the Empire at least, don't really make much sense. Now the droids I think it's fine, you have a group of B1s led by a raider with a couple of B2s and or a commando droid. That's how it's shown for the most part in the Clone Wars and it's really fun to fight against. However with the Empire, it's still really whack in my opinion. What kind of, ho of, what kind of hostiles you do encounter? Scout Troopers should not be classified as the normal foot soldier in this game. That should be the Stormtroopers. There were a couple moments in this game where I was literally surrounded by 6-10 to 10 Stormtroopers with batons and a couple with riot shields. 
And combat-wise, yeah, it's fun, but realistically, that's not how the Empire would organise their troops. I also just want to talk about cutscenes for a second. As technology has grown and game developers have learned how to make better things in game engines, they seem to have adopted this idea of going for in-engine cinematics. Now, it works quite well for the fluidity of the game, because it means you can seamlessly transition between cinematic and gameplay. However, the problem is, is that it drastically decreases the quality of a cutscene. Take the scene from Halo Infinite with Atriox, for example. He looks badass in this prologue because this cutscene is pre-rendered, but when you see him later on at the end of the game, in the epilogue I think it is, he looks completely different. And you see this issue in Survivor as well. In Fallen Order, to give a different example, the main giveaway in this game is the in-engine and pre-rendered Darth Vader. You can see from these two images that are on the screen now that the, two, the difference between the two is drastically different. Now, you don't really see it so much with Cal and Sia, but as soon as you get Darth Vader in that thing, you know that Darth Vader's supposed to be this so shiny, you know, his model's supposed to be big, bulky, shiny, and really good textures. It just looks really bad. However, in this game, everything beyond, I think, the prologue, which is sort of like the recap of Fallen Order, everything in this game is in-engine cutscenes-wise. And there are a lot of times you don't notice it, because the graphical quality and the models and such are so high fidelity and so high quality that you don't really notice it, which I think is good. But when you get up close to Cal or Grease, the quality of their hair or Darth Vader, when compared to Fallen Order's pre-rendered version, it really gives away that it is in engine. I know that from working in Traitor, it's a nightmare to get right and looking, looking well. But even Darth Vader, when you compare him, and I'm not saying he looks bad by any stretch of the imagination, but look at Darth Vader in Fallen Order in the pre-rendered cutscene, and look at Darth Vader in Jedi Survivor, it doesn't compare. It's so... Darth, the, the pre-rendered cutscenes are superior, and no one will change my mind on that. You know, it may be a personal thing, because I use game engines a lot for Traitor, so I can tell the difference pretty easily. But personally, I would be willing to sacrifice seamless gameplay to cutscene transitions to get better looking cutscenes in general. Finally, I want to talk about the customization, because this game has drastically improved the customization every single way. Everything you see in this game can be taken apart, swapped around for a new part, and swapped around for new parts. Your lightsaber, BD1, Cal himself, and not just his clothes, but his hair as well, which makes some quite funny combinations, I have to say. But even your blaster you can customise, which I was really surprised that they actually added that feature in. The only thing I did find a little bit strange was that they took out the customization option for the Mantis colours, which I thought was a bit strange, but I do quite like the default colours for the Mantis, so it didn't really bother me that much. So, that's my review for Jedi Survivor. As I said, this game is by no means perfect, but I had such a blast playing it, and I would say that it is my now my favourite Star Wars game ever. Even the issues that I have with it, and not that are not performance, were just nitpicks that never really pulled me out of the game much, so I don't really mind them, but as far as the review is concerned, I feel like I need to bring them up. So that is what I have time for in this, in this review video here. I thank you all for watching. If you did enjoy, don't forget to smash that like button and hit the subscribe button for more awesome gaming content or any other content that you may that I may choose to post. So hope you guys have enjoyed and I shall see you all later. Bye!